Welcome to the Banff World Media Festival. Your session is about to begin. Welcome to the second annual Dealmakers Live competition. Today, we've got 200 audience voters, six participants, five judges, four sponsors, three finalists, and two lifelines standing by. But first, the one and only host from CBC's Mr. D and about 300 other shows, direct from Halifax, Jonathan Torrens. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thanks so much to both of you who clapped. That was awfully kind. Welcome to Dealmakers Live. This is 2.0. So a round of applause. Who was here last year? A few folks, a baker's dozen of folks. Well, welcome back. For those of you who were here, you know how it works. For those of you who weren't here, it's exactly like last year's show, which you didn't see, but we've made a couple of changes. One is I have hair like Beethoven now for some reason. The second is, in the spirit of counter-programming last year, we opted to schedule Dealmakers Live opposite Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals with the Vancouver Canucks. Bad idea. This year, we got in touch with Gary Bettman early, and he worked with us to get the puck drop moved to 6 p.m. our time. So if you pay attention, we should be out of here in time to see what could be the LA Kings hoist the Stanley Cup for the first time in their not-that-storied history. So, here's what you're about to see. I can promise you deal makers, I can promise you they will be live. Other than that, everything is up for grabs. Six pitchers will each share with you their very real ideas for TV shows. It's up to you, the audience, to pick the three that will move to the second round. You'll notice we've distributed some handheld units to many of your chairs. You will use those to vote for the pitchers after we see all six. So it's important that you pay attention to each of the six pitchers as they happen, because you'll be asked to recall their pitches when you vote. Then it's up to our impressive panel of judges to choose the ultimate winner of the coveted Golden Handshake Trophy. That's worth some applause, no? <laughs> yeah. To make something coveted, I think all you have to do is say it's coveted. Our judges will choose the ultimate winner in round two. So without any further ado, let's meet our judges. First, she's the vice president of original content for Shaw Media and my one-time boss. Please say hello to last year's returning head judge, Christine Shipton. Hello, Christine. Nice to see you again. Thank you. So Christine, just quick like a bunny, what are some of the do's of a good pitch? What do you look for? You know, it's just really simple. Uh, make sure you tell us what it's about in a clear and simple way. Okay, here's That's the idea. All it is. It's a horse running for municipal office. Okay, okay? I'm going to go sit down It's a family drama. It's called I'm Running for Mayor. I'm going to sit down now, Jonathan. Thank you. It's a tap in. Are you kidding? It's a one inch putt. Next, she's the senior vice president, Sky Networks and Entertainment. Say hello to Rebecca Siegel. Here she comes. Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. How are you today? So conversely, what are some of the don'ts of a pitch? I think the biggest thing is to don't uh, second guess yourself, don't try to please me, stay true to your vision. Amen. Okay. Thank you for being here, Rebecca. Nice to see you. Uh, Brian Hunt is the head of creative development for Yahoo. Brian, come on out here. Nice to see you, Brian. Thanks for being here. First time in Banff from New York. I've heard of it. What do you think of Banff so far? I did the oxygen tank, so that was my big... Uh, Is that code yeah. for something? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, how interesting. Uh, is pitching a show for online content the same as pitching a television show, or is it different? The key for us uh, is, first and foremost, is the story, the content. So in that regard, it's the same. We care about, is it good? Second, though, budgets are different, formats are different, so you should really think about that before you go in how is this aligned with what we're already doing? Right. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Thanks, Thanks for being here, Brian. Round of applause for Brian Hunt, everybody. Next, the CEO of E1 Television. I've heard of it, too. Please welcome John Moranis. John. You know, the word on the street, John, and around the mountains, mm -hmm. is that you're quite a piano player. Any chance we'll get to hear you play later tonight? Uh, it's possible, and I, I'm really good when people get really drunk. Are you taking requests? Uh, yes, I say no to them. Oh, good, okay, yeah. but you do take them. <laughs> I will take them in and then I will respond. Perfect. Yes. John, how many pitches did it take you before you thought you finally cracked that nut and knew what you were doing out there? I'm still waiting for that pitch, so I'm hoping to today this is gonna happen. Have you ever not sold a show? Uh, never. Everything I do, I sell. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they're horrible, but I sell them. Sure. 
That's what they call pouring <laughs> syrup over poo, John. Thanks Thank for being you. here. TV by the pound. Uh, it's worthy of noting that Paul Chard, who's the global head of content for Mediacom, is from England, so I think the time change might have thrown him off. He will join us in progress. He's not here yet. No need to give him a round of applause. We can pay him back when he gets here. So without any further ado, let's now meet our six brave finalists. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2012 deal makers. Here they come. You guys look like a Benetton ad. Fresh faced and happy, don't they? You can smell the optimism clean off them from here. Uh, folks, in addition to bragging rights and the coveted golden handshake trophy, I bet you're also curious as to what else you'll be playing for this afternoon. Take your look balls and stick them on the monitors down front. Here it comes. A third generation Apple Ipid, as we say in the East Coast. A one-on-one -on -one meeting with the judge of your choice, Judge Reinhold not included. VIP seating at the Rocky, although you could probably get them, let's be honest. VIP seating at the Rockies Gala and the coveted 2012 Golden Handshake Trophy. So that's not nothing, which is a double negative, meaning that's something. Let's hear a round of applause for that. It's a big deal. So, round one is called the elevator pitch. That's your basic short form pitch delivered in the amount of time you'd have if, say, you bought, uh, bumped into a buyer in a bathroom or, say, an elevator or a bathroom in an elevator, which is what you have at E1, right, John? You'll have 60 seconds. Is there a piano in there too? Yeah. <laughs> There's a penis in the bathroom at E1, it's crazy. You'll have 60 seconds to deliver your pitch, but at the end of 60 seconds, your mic will shut off, so make sure you wrap it up in plenty of time. Know when to stop talking is the golden rule of the pitch. Uh, the final three will go on to round two as voted on by the, by the audience. Round two is an eight minute more in depth interview with our judges, that's where they'll get to explore each of you deeply and personally. Um, and then we will determine one winner after that. Does anybody have any questions? Great, off you go backstage to prepare. There they are, your deal makers. So audience, uh, remember to watch each of the pitches very carefully because you won't be voting after each one. You will be voting for them all one at a time at the end. And judges, um, you need to pay close attention too because although you don't technically vote for the three that get to round two, you may come into play in a way that I will pay off later. That's what they call foreshadowing in this crazy business we call show. So, are you ready to see your first deal maker? Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Lisa Charlie Boy and Shane Belcourt. Here they come. Just to be clear, who's Lisa and who's Shane? I'm Lisa, this is Shane. Okay, great, nice to have you guys here. <laughs> How many times would you say conservatively you've rehearsed your pitch? 50, 100? 500. No difference 500. between any of those numbers, so ballpark. No, no. Somewhere yeah. between 50 and 500? Exactly, Okay. Yeah. And do you think pitching as a group of two is better in that you can kind of relieve each other and take a deep breath, or do you think it's a little more difficult to work out that dance? I think it's better. I absolutely love having Shane by my side. Well, you know what they say about dance, it's a vertical expression of a horizontal intention. So, <laughs> here's what you're going to see. Five second countdown clock. At the end of the five second countdown clock, you'll see 60 seconds on the clock. That will be your time to commence speaking. Okay. At the end of 60 seconds, as I said, the mic will shut off. Are you ready, Lisa? I'm ready. Are you pumped, Shane? Let's do this. Let the five okay. second countdown clock begin now. Fashion magazines, I love them, and I always have. When I was a little girl, I used to read them all the time to escape from my problems. I'd even make collages out of them. But what I really wanted to do was to cut myself out of my own life and paste myself inside those pages. Not like they would have me, a native girl from the backwoods of BC. At 17, I moved to the big city to study fashion in university and chase my dream. What I was told is that being native and being in fashion don't mix. But I'm here to tell you that's a myth. I write a top fashion blog called Urban Native Girl, and it's time for me to take my blog and turn it into a glossy lifestyle native magazine. 
and this is where Brett Wilson comes in. Uh, he's like Canada's Donald Trump. He's asked Lisa to present him with a business plan and a mock-up magazine, and then he can see if he can make her dreams come true. Uh, Native Girl is a 13-part documentary series that will follow Lisa and her team as they try to make their dreams come true and prove that fashion in... Uh... 60 seconds goes by fast. Let's hear it for Lisa and Shane. It goes by fast. It does. Stay put for one second, yeah. you guys. Brett Wilson, you're hanging your hat on a celebrity. He's Canada's Kenny G more so, though, right, with the hair? Um, can you deliver on Brett Wilson? Yes, he's a good friend. How do you feel that that pitch went overall, Lisa? I think it went quite well. You didn't even breathe. It was astonishing. You talked for 35 seconds. Just, just straight through, yeah. Wonderful job, you guys. Lisa and Shane, one more time. Make your way backstage, guys. Excellent job. Audience, take a moment now to stamp Lisa and Shane's image and pitch into your mental viewfinder for quick recall mere moments from now. Put your hands together for our next, thank you, sir. For our next pitchers, Jordan Gross and Andre Vexler. Here they come. Jordan, Andre. Gentlemen, you have stacked the deck. It would appear as though there's a smattering of applause directed in your um, direction. Andre, who are those people? Not a clue, but I'm happy because we're winging it. Jordan, anyone you'd like to say, to back, uh, say hi to back home? Uh, hi, Mom. It's not on TV, dude. No one's going to hear you. <laughs> How many times have you guys rehearsed your pitch? Uh, about 50 times, easy. Are you fired up? You feeling ready? Rocking it. Jordan, on your cue, I will call for the countdown clock. You ready? Constipated. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan and Andre, five-second <laughs> countdown clock starts. Do you need a moment? Do you need a modium? No, I can, 60 seconds, I can hold <laughs> it. Right. I'm good. I'm good. Let's pause for a modium. No, no, let's Here comes the five-second countdown clock. Yeah, right. Speed it up. Here it comes right now. Daring to Dream is a factual entertainment series that showcases the incredible people behind the Make-A-Wish Foundation and the children whose wishes they fulfill. Now, we all, all know how hard they work to help make these sick children's dream come to reality. But we don't think it's good enough. No, what we want to do is actually make these dreams more awesome. You know, if a child wants you to go to Disneyland, that's awesome. But what's more awesome? Turning him into a cartoon character and having him star in a short with his favorite Disney characters. That's right, if a kid wants to meet his favorite sports team, that's pretty awesome. But what's more awesome? Bringing him off the bench and putting him in the game to win the big game. Now, how are we gonna pay for all this awesome? Make-A-Wish already works with major companies like Ikea, Sony, and Disney, so for the framework for sponsorships is already there. Look, what we believe is that there are no dreamer is ever too small and no dream is ever too big. This show is about kids, families, and incredible people who never stop daring to dream. Thank you. Jordan and Andre, nice job with a few seconds to boot. I noticed you had a few seconds left over. Did 60 seconds fly by or would you say it dragged? We wanted to give you more air time. Oh yeah, because that's what everybody wants to hear is more of my high-pitched nasally whine. Jordan, how do you think that went? Moist. <laughs> thank you very next. Time will tell. Jordan and Andre, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and candor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your next pitcher, Judy Handelman. Oh, Judy? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Chard. Sorry, guys, I, uh, I overslept. That's, uh... In theory, the seven and a half hour time difference should have worked in your favor to be here. <laughs> Are you here already for tomorrow's session? Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Chard. Make some noise for him. This guy's been everywhere all week long. Uh, nice to have you, Paul. Here's what you missed. My hair looks like Beethoven. A few great pitches. Morale's at an all-time high. And you're about to meet Judy Handelman. Judy, come on out here. Hello. Judy, would you believe I came dangerously close to wearing the same outfit this afternoon? I do not believe that, Boy, actually. Boy, would my face have been red. <laughs> Is it true that I understand you are the sister of fictitious TV character Skippy Handelman? Actually, funny that you should ask that because my brother has had that nickname for very many years. I bet. He did. And some very unoriginal friends to boot. I guess so. So, Judy, you're what from does that Montreal. Say about your comedy? No, I'm from Toronto. You're from Toronto, Ontario, yeah. but yeah. you live in Montreal, I think. No, I do not. No, but I mean the <laughs> suburb uh, called Montreal just outside of downtown Toronto. Oh, yes, that named, place. Used yes. to be Leslieville. Oh, yeah, no, I don't live there either. Well, welcome. It's nice <laughs> to have you here. <laughs> 
How are you feeling about your pitch, Judy, as a Montrealer who <laughs> now lives in Toronto? I did live in Montreal for a while, so you're sure. not that far off. Yeah. Uh, I'm feeling great. Wonderful. Well, you look great. Thank you. And I wish you the very best of luck. If you're all set, I'll call for the countdown clock. All right. Here it comes. Five seconds on the countdown clock, starting now. Make Your Mark is for creative, passionate young minds who are the change they want to see in the world. It's a competition-based reality series for tweens, where young people compete to raise money to fund their ideas on how to make the world a better place. Think of The Apprentice, but for tweens and with a philanthropic approach. So instead of competing for a job, they're competing to change the world. These are the entrepreneurs of the future with a conscience. 12 big personalities with big ideas. These, this series will test if they have what it takes to turn their dreams into a reality, with weekly challenges that test their abilities and are a perfect opportunity for brand sponsors to show off their corporate social responsibility. Online, a community of kids pools resources and ideas and works together to create change. One voice, one idea, one inspirational kid will rise above all to make your mark. Judy Handelman with time to spare on the clock. Montreal or nothing. That was great. You. How'd you feel about it, Judy? I feel pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. You didn't even stall or stumble or trip over your own mouth? Well, how would it be right for a performer to l reveal any of their secrets? You know, I've been <laughs> revealing my secrets since 1987, and look at me. <laughs> I'm on a 12, 12 by 12 stage in Banff <laughs> with Judy Handelman. Dare to dream, folks. This is what can happen. Judy Handelman, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a moment now at the halfway mark, which is roughly 50% of the way through, if my math is correct, and check in with our judges, Christine Shipton. Pretty good pictures so far. Really good. Like, very focused and clear. It's like, we're getting it. We're getting it. Would you say we've raised the bar from last I year? I think so. I think not that last year was bad, but no, no, I think so. Yeah. I think uh, having the bar open since noon has done yes, a lot for our Yes, that's helped. That's helped. Brian Hunt, yeah. your thoughts so far on what you've heard? Yeah, I like it. Sounds good. I could see it working for us, working on television. I mean, I'm, I'm utilizing the open bar, so yeah. it's helping. Oh, good. <laughs> You're drinking through it, as they yeah. say. Rebecca Siegel. Yes. How are you feeling so far? I'm like, feeling I mean, just fine, John. <laughs> like emotionally. Like our... Emotionally, I'm just fine. The make-a-wish thing, I'm emotionally just fine. Um, can you tell in the, the first little, few little... seconds of a pitch if you're buying it? Mm, no. Um, go on. <laughs> John Moranis. Three pitches, all good, no stumbling, everybody's having a good time, no stage fright. What do you think? I'm very impressed and a little jealous. I think they're fantastic. In fact, I feel a little inadequate right now. Are you going to pull anyone aside and maybe buy some of the shows that you've been hearing so far? Uh, yes, I'm going to offer cash to all of them, probably. I mean, we're not talking a lot, 25 cents, 30 Canadian cents. Canadian money, sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, or minimally, he'll play the song that they've chosen. That right, they that's good. <laughs> and Paul, having only heard the last pitch, what did you think of the first two? Well, well, uh, <laughs> well I have to say, of all the ones I've heard, I did like the last one. <laughs> yeah, the last right. One. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're all in the top three so far, so <laughs> your instincts are good. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet Janelle Joseph. Here she comes. Janelle. Hi, Janelle Joseph. Hello. How are you today? I'm well. Let me say I'm a fan of alliteration. Oh, thank and you. And you seem like a nice person. I see. Um, yes. How many times have you rehearsed your pitch? Um, maybe about 30, but uh, I, I don't have it memorized, so I will sometimes glance. Well, the interesting thing is, of all the pictures this afternoon, you were the one with your Blackberry scrolling along and reading as you performed it. Do you think that's uh, uh, going to help you? Um, well, I don't have my Blackberry, but um, hopefully it did help me. So what is that you have there? Um, it's a paper. It's, what? it's a what now? Paper. Q, a Q note. Is that, like the, is that the iPad 3? That's the latest? Well, I mean, if I, if I win it, oh. at least I can upgrade. Banff trees. Of course. I was thinking this morning at 5.30 on top of the mountain as I was doing yoga lattes. We're so lucky to work in this business and be here, aren't we, Janelle? Yeah, yeah. Here's hoping are. you get to work a lot more in this business That's after okay. you knock them dead with this pitch. You feeling good and ready? Thank you. Five um, seconds on the countdown clock. Here it comes. Woo-hoo! Five, four, three, two, one. Do you know the number one reason for relationship breakups? It's money. Have you heard of financial guru and author of I Heart Money, David Lester? 
Well, he's president of DCL Capital, which is a finance firm that launched their income portfolio in BNN four months ago. He's also our finance and relationship docu-reality, blonde, gay, and awesome finance and life coach. In 21 days, he takes a couple on a journey that has them examine their differences and sheds light on basically the financial dissatisfaction that they're having and their dead in the water sex life. They then forge a mutually agreed upon booty contract that is notarized. David has each couple then work to fulfill short term intimacy as well as financial contract item terms with a day 21 finance and intimacy fantasy twist. From dicks to debt, cooters and kids, pensioners and peckers, it'll be a series that takes finance and money to the next level. Have you been reading my diary? I feel like you really spoke to me. How did you think that went, Janelle? I thought it went pretty well. I think it went well. The show, I didn't call it financial foreplay. I was waiting till the end to get there, but it's Technically, you're foreplay. sneaking through uh, a few uh -huh. extra details after the 60 well, seconds is over. Sorry. But I do want to ask, is Daniel Lester, is he the guy, he, wasn't he just on Conan? Uh, that's not D Daniel, it's David, my guy, David oh. Lester. Oh, David Lester. Yeah, yeah. I call him Daniel for not that short. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. But anyway, we all have nicknames for people. Like, Get out of here, you crazy kid. Uh, Janelle, everybody. That was Janelle Joseph. Now say hi to Daniel Oren. Here he comes, Daniel. With a simple change of accessories from what I'm wearing, you can glide from day in to night. This is the biggest elevator I've ever seen. <laughs> it's a big elevator. <laughs> this must be the E1 elevator. Yeah, it is indeed. Um, how are you feeling, Daniel? Feeling great. And I understand you're traveling tonight on a plane? Yes, I've never heard that one. You probably know that one, John Moranis. No. Daniel, the Elton John tune? Yes, I do. Sure. I play it. Makes me tick. <laughs> um, if you do well tonight, maybe John will play it for you. Are you all fired up and pumped? I am. Five seconds on the countdown clock. Here comes Daniel. Thank you. Five seconds from now. A kid knocks at your door. It's an emergency. The family's new to the neighborhood, and their pet tiger has gone missing. After a crazy chase with a bizarre family, will the neighbor agree to wear salami as bait? Well, it turns out it was all a hoax. The Hoaxmans is a half-hour reality comedy series that follows a family of four that conducts real hidden camera hoaxes on the unsuspecting public, sort of mythbusters for the human behavior. In each episode, the family will pose a question, like, how far can you push your realtor before they walk away from the big sale? To answer that question, they're going to brainstorm and create a hoax, employ expert help, create characters, and finally they're going to unleash their hoax on their marks for pretty much the biggest payoff they can get. Will the pizza delivery boy agree to take a side in an over-the-top divorce argument? What would it take to get the dog walker to walk the pet python? Well, the Hoaxmans are one family you want on TV, but definitely not in your hood. Wow, well done, Daniel. To answer your question, in rural Nova Scotia, a pizza man will walk you through your divorce. <laughs> Two for one. Pizza. Uh -huh. <laughs> 30 minutes or it's free legal <laughs> services. Um, Daniel, how did it feel? Oh, great. Sounded pretty great to us. Let's yeah. hear it for Daniel, everybody. Nice job. <laughs> Remember, audience, lock it in because you will be called upon to vote for each one after our sixth and final pitcher. Here comes AJ Dalla. AJ, come on out. I like that entrance move. Does that have a name? That's my super dance step, you know what? Super dance step. It's the AJ Dalla. Um, AJ, how many times have you practiced this pitch? I did it once for my oh, seven... Oh, hang on one sec. Oh. AJ Dalla, the dance move is trending on Twitter. This thing's just blown up bigger than all of us. How many times have you practiced it? I did it once for my seven-year-old, but he hated it, but that's a tough demographic. I'll say. Those, those are my people. That's my wheelhouse right there. Um, AJ, you know how it works. Five seconds on the countdown clock. When the five seconds are up, your pitch will start. You all set? All right, Jarek, let's rock it. Here comes the five-second countdown clock now. My wife's going to hate me for saying this, but women love shopping, and they're experts at it. But are they experts at shopping for love? Love shopping is a dating game show that tests notions like women's intuition, chemistry, animal magnetism, and love at first sight. So the show concept is two female contestants 
20 matches that have been set up by a dating computer, 20 questions, three public displays of affection, and one big-ass department store. And the clock is ticking. The women push these giant shopping carts around the store, and what they do is they ask the guys questions like, do you like pets? They flirt, they kiss, they fight over the guys, and they throw the ones they like in the giant shopping cart. But they can only have three in there at any one time. At the end of the show, they go to the checkout, and they can only have their favorite guy in there. And the winner is the one with the most compatible guy as chosen by the dating computer. They get a trip for two, and the losers get a lunch coupon. Thank you very much. Great job, AJ Dalla. Let's hear it for him, everybody. Well done, AJ. How did it feel? I think my son was right. You think he was right? Well, time will tell. I'm going to ask you to retreat to the back of the stage, but stay close as I bring out the rest of the pitchers. AJ, turn around. Do a button hook and come on back and lead the rest of your friends. Pitchers, come on back out on stage. Here they come. All your pitchers. I don't know if you're like me, I can feel it in my mouth. It's called anticipation, and I'm marinating in it right now. Because that brings us to the end of the round one pitches, and it's time to vote. So first, I'm going to ask Shane and Lisa to come front and center. Audiences, here's uh, just so you know, Here's how your voting gizmo works. Pick it up in your hand, that's step number one. When the voting opens for each contestant, you'll have several seconds to register a vote between zero and 10. Zero being a goose egg and not very good, 10 being you loved it a lot. And we will reveal each score at the end of each vote. So, to give the people a recap, 60 seconds was hard enough. Can you tell us in one, uh, one sentence or less what your show is about, just to remind the good people? It's a docu-soap workplace series that follows me and my team as I put together a mock-up magazine to present to Brett Wilson. So it's a docu work a maggoty Exactly that. Okay, not another one of those. It's a little on the nose, Lisa. Let's open the voting for Lisa and Shane now. Lisa, you're beaming. You're so optimistic. Surely that's enough to turn one knob, isn't it? Let's take a look and see uh, the score for Lisa and Shane. The average of all of your handheld units is 5.08. Good news is you're in first place. Bad news is there's still some time to come. I'll ask you to retreat over beside your colleagues. Bring Jordan and Andre back up one more time. Jordan, remind the people in a sentence what your show is about. Our show is called uh, Daring to Dream, and it focuses on the incredible people behind the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Indeed. Folks, you probably remembered it was a great pitch. Let the voting for Jordan and Andre begin now. Special thanks to Wyndham Hill for furnishing the suspense music for this afternoon. No one has that collection? What is the score for Jordan and Andre out of 10? Is it higher or lower than Lisa and Shane? Let us take a look now. 6.26, nice job guys, currently in first place. Still anybody's game? You remember Judy Handelman as well as I do. Here she comes. Judy, in one sentence, or even less if you can, tell us about your show just one more time. Uh, it's a reality show in the style of The Apprentice for tweens where kids have a chance to make a real difference in the world. Let the voting for Judy Handelman begin now. Can I say hi to my friends and family at home? Sure. Can if you like. Can't guarantee they're going to see or hear it. So where does Judy Handelman fall in this Neapolitan of a top three? Judy's score is 6.16. Nice job, Judy. It's a great score. Janelle Joseph, come on back up. You're next. You all remember Janelle. What was your show about in one sentence or less? Financial Foreplay is a um, docu-reality finance and relationship show. All right. Let the voting for Janelle begin now. This is where if it was uh, So You Think You Can Dance Canada, you'd have to come up with a clever way of doing that oh, with your number. Janelle Joseph. Out of a possible 10, the average score is 3.91. That's OK, Janelle. It was an excellent pitch. 
That's a hard thing to do, get up in front of a room full of strangers and pitch your heart out in 60 seconds. I'll tell you that for free. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> come on back up stage. Daniel, you have a one month old. I do. Congratulations. Thank you. Do you know who the mom is? Still waiting for Maury's word. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, paternity tests, you see. Maternity tests revealed? It was that one Not trip so to much. Saskatchewan. Let you know. the voting for Daniel open now. <laughs> Don't want to know my show? Oh, of course. Lamb of God, where's and my And he's head? the one that has been not sleeping for the baby. Daniel, tell us in one sentence or less what no. the show is about again. No. That's it? I'm sorry, I blew it. <laughs> it's a half-hour reality comedy series about a family of hoaxers. A family of hoaxers called the Hoaxmans. Let the voting for Daniel reopen. Just in case his one <laughs> sentence swayed you one way or t'other. Take a few seconds to vote for Daniel. Think of my child. And what is Daniel's average score out of 10? 6.47, nice job, Daniel. Thank you. That's a high score. And finally, AJ Dalla, come on up, AJ. That's a new dance move. I'm working on it, I'm working on it. You're already right. trying to be the next thing. It, That's AJ 2.0. Uh, tell the people in one sentence what your show is about again. Love shopping, a dating game show where girls shop for guys. What's with the perv voice? <laughs> That's the demographic. Yeah, yes it is. Let the voting for perv city open with AJ right now. AJ, would you care to predict where you think your score will fall? Somewhere between zero and one. Interesting. Oh, you're like Price is Right, lowest bidder. Let's take a look at the score for AJ. 3.85. It's a good score out of 10. So ladies and gentlemen, based on your voting, it would appear as though in third place, Judy Handelman. Judy, come on up. It would appear as though in second place, based on your voting, Jordan and Andre. Congratulations, guys. And after the audience vote in round one, currently in first place is Daniel Oron. Daniel, come on up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for your top three and your bottom three. Takes a lot of moxie to get up here and do that. Well done. Stay put, you guys. In life, as in show business, sometimes things don't go just the way we hoped they would. This is where the twist in our program comes. The judges, who have mostly been sitting drinking for the first part of the show, water, straight vodka, now will get to implement, should they choose, one swap out. Do you think the audience got it right with the top three, or do you think someone, based on your experience, is missing? First, let's kill the judges' mics. Then let's give them a moment to decide if they'd like to switch someone out. Can we have the suspense track, please? Yeah. Love shopping. Welcome back to Love Shopping. You can find us online at loveshopping.orgasm. They're in a heated head-to-head -head the same way they are on Love Shopping. <laughs> You're right. I want to be on the branding team for Love Shopping. I've been on the branding team since the day I got here on this earth. Okay, Christine, you're the jury four person. No need to rise, but would you please share with us your verdict? Are you gonna keep the top three as is? Are you gonna swap someone out? If so, who? If so, for whom? After much deliberation for the 30 seconds, uh, we actually have decided, and sorry about this to everybody, because everybody did do a great job, that uh, we're going to go with the audience choice. Wow. Here are these three. Absolutely. Which means round of applause for your yeah. top three. And keep yeah. it going for your bottom three, Lisa, Shane, Janelle, AJ. Great job, you guys. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here and being a part of it. Wow, that is bananas. I'm going to ask you to cock yourselves and take eight steps back to that corner of the stage. Think about what just happened, be proud of yourself, and wonder what's about to happen, because now, it's time for round two. 
So this is what's happened. The judges have heard your idea, as have the folks in the audience. They like it, and they want to hear more. So in round two, you'll have an eight-minute meeting, but you won't be by yourself. Someone once told me that making a television show is like 50 people trying to write a straight line with a giant pencil, and it's true. You won't have 50, but you will have two industry lifelines here to help you should you need to call on them in your eight-minute meeting. The first is your high-powered CAA agent, Rob Keneally, who's here. Come on up, Rob. Nice to see you again, Rob. Rob was here last year. Hi, Rob. Hi, how are you? So you can validate uh, people's pitches and feelings and also their parking? Uh, I can do all of that, yes. And is it true you can get me uh, uh, Kings tickets? <laughs> the game starts in an hour, is that true? That's true, in an hour. And a helicopter? And anything's possible. All right, Rob Keneally, everybody. Have a seat, Rob. Thanks for being here. And next, the CEO of Original Productions and the man behind, I think, every show currently on television. <laughs> Tom Beers is here. Nice to have you here, Tom. It's nice to have you, Tom. Thank you so much. The man, of course, behind Deadliest Catch, Ice Road Truckers, and we're actually piloting this as it's happening right now called You're Dying Up There, right? Yeah, it's a show about my experience at Dealmakers 2.0. So, um, Rob and Tom are here to help you because if you find yourself faltering for any reason, they're industry heavyweights. You have a format question. You have an agent you would like a uh, question you would like your agent to handle. You can throw to them at any time. Round of applause for our lifelines, Rob and Tom. <laughs> Three finalists. I'm going to send you off so you can uh, prepare one last time. Off stage you go. Thanks for being here. Don't trip. We'll see you one at a time, just in a, a moment or two from now. If it wasn't confusing enough, and if you're not sick of the sound of my voice already, let me explain the final twist, which is the perception analyzer. The judges also have been armed with the handheld units that you and the audience have. So in this next round, the judges and you, the audience collectively, will be giving real-time reactions to what's happening during the pitch. If you hear something you like, crank it up. If you hear something you don't like, turn it down. And we're going to call on from Deloitte, Canada, Duncan is here. Come on up, Duncan. He's going to be our real-time industry context analysis analysis. Does all that fit on a business card? Uh, you should see my hockey jersey. It goes down both arms. Oh, does it really? Nice to have you here, Duncan. Round of applause for Duncan, everybody. <laughs> Duncan Stewart. So let's just practice for a moment the real-time uh, analyzing and give you some practice with the handheld units. Here's my pitch. Who doesn't love Kenny Loggins? <laughs> but wait, there's more. What if Kenny Loggins opens a chain of logins across the states? It's called Loggins Logins. And here's the cross-platform thing. To get onto the website, you have to Kenny Login. <laughs> Loggins Logins with the login. That's my pitch. So use your perception analyzer to rate that pitch. Christine? <laughs> Let's make this happen. <laughs> but wait, there's more. OK, so that was one that obviously most of the judges and you, the collective audience, didn't like. It's called? Bayo, daylight come and we want to go home. <laughs> Scott Bayo on an island being chased by 80 soap opera enthusiasts. Bayo, it's a layup. Vote for that now. Or just sign a check, John, whatever's easier. I see, Brian Hunt, we could do it online. We could do it online and love shopping. Love shopping, you can do it online. So everybody knows how the perception analyzers work. Duncan Stewart, thank you for being here. We'll check in with you after the eight minutes. Lifelines, I'll encourage you to jump in and uh, help out our finalists as we get there. Judges, you're in the hot seat this time because the fate of our three finalists is largely in your hands. So let us bring out our first finalist. I don't remember you from round one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a first and last name basis with her, Judy Handelman. Come on out here, Judy. Judy, tell the people about the magical orb of Fandalu you're wearing around your neck. Oh, uh, well, this is actually a very special. Do you really want to hear the whole story? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this Another is time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much. It's a good luck thing. Let's just okay, say. so here's what's going to happen. You're going to have eight <laughs> minutes on the clock. Um, it's going to be a back and forth simulated industry meeting, as it would be. Christine, you'll start us off. Let's have the countdown clock to the eight minute meeting with Judy Handelman starting now. Five, four, three, two, one. Hi, Judy. How are you? I'm good, thanks. 
No. no. I'll matter. translate. Hi, Judy. Matter. How are you? <laughs> Just give us a bit of a, an overview of what the, the structure, we know it's a reality mm -hmm. competition, but just talk to us a little bit about the structure of, of the show. Okay, so it's 13 episodes, half hours, it's for kids. Um, each episode has one challenge involved in it. Um, the challenges tie into corporate social responsibility projects and have big brand sponsors to them. So in each episode, the kids will be competing um, and the competition will have something that benefits a community organization or a charity. But the, who comes up with the challenges? Okay, so there's two levels of, of ideas here. There's one that the kids themselves have to submit oh, ideas yeah. on how to make the world a better place and that's how they get entered into the competition. And ultimately, that's what they're competing for. They're competing to get their idea funded. Um, but then the challenges are, are created by us and they're, they're done to test the basic skills of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship and philanthropy and to see if the kids have what it takes to you know, take real money and make it, turn it into a real project. So when the show starts, and I won't hog this, do we all know what each kid's dream is that they hope to win to yes. do? Yes, yes. So we, as an audience, we're rooting for those kids and what it is they want to do. Exactly. Okay, any questions? You guys can pick up on this. Well, I'll ask one thing. Host, celebrity host, <laughs> is it a Donald Trump thing? It's, it's not Donald Trump because it's for tweens, so I'd like to make it a little more age appropriate. And I w there would be a celebrity host, I've been speaking to some, and I'd like to throw to my agent to help me <laughs> with this question. Well, we have. We've been talking to all of our young sort of tween fantastic acts, and just borrowing from last year, Justin Bieber kind of comes to mind. Someone shiny, someone who cares and falls into the brand. Anybody else? Take um, in terms of the, the kind of tie-in with the sponsors mm -hmm. and then something that's going to benefit the community, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, why don't I give an example of a that sample type of challenge. So uh, I'm going to use, I mean, really I would look to have, it would be great to have one brand sponsor sponsor the entire thing, like a large company like we learned about yesterday, like how P&G's, you know, and then they have a lot of brands underneath them. So they could use each brand in an episode and focus something more specifically to the target demographic. But just for an example's sake, I'm going to give you an example of a Canadian company called Tim Hortons, a coffee company, and they support, um, they support sending kids to camp. So an example for a, a kind of challenge would be uh, for kids to promote and create a camp day. So they'd be in charge of baking smile cookies and uh, making coffee and selling it and they wouldn't be given any of the the ingredients so they'd have to make everything and they'd be, it would be a challenge to compete to see which team would sell more cookies and which team would raise more money for the charity and, and how is that benefiting the community oh because so um, gonna, it would be the raise selling cookies yeah because the cookies themselves the money from it would fund Tim Horton's children's charity so it would send kids to camp but, That's can I just the, add, but at the end of every episode some kid gets booted out it, it is an elimination series. We're going to see a kid cry right. and get booted out and never be, see his dream come true. Well, this is the thing. Every episode... <laughs> Every episode, well, at the end of the day, this, this, is, this is television, and these are kids who may have wonderful ideas, but they may not have the chops to actually take real money and make something real with it. So what we're looking at is these kids are still participating in a challenge. They're still benefiting the community within the episodes that they're, that they're participating okay. in, and they're getting mentored, and they're, having, they're, they're, you know, they're dealing with change in their own lives as well. So on The Apprentice, which kind of is falling until they started doing the celebrities. It's the argument and the whining and seeing all these people kind of conflict that is compelling often. Where does that come in? With, is it more the altruism or is it more watching them you, make you might jump in with you too just to help yeah, you Yeah, please, manage. thank yeah, you. Yeah, because look, I think the important thing here is that, you know, we all need to compare. We need to, we need to know who's winning, who, lose, who loses. I mean, kids particularly. You know, so if you're going for that tween audience, they need to clearly know how to root. They've got to root for one person or the other. You know, so in essence, it, it's, it's a pure competition series. And, and I think that's the essence of the show. So absolutely, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to answer your question as well, Brian, I... I think there will be drama, but there will also be moments of, of laughter and joy. And this is for kids. And so the, the challenges would also be designed in such a way that it brings out the funny and, and hopefully setting up situations where there could be physical humor and comedy and all of the things that you know, are inherent in every kid's property. Okay, the, 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 I'm going, just going to go back to the community thing again because I think that's a great way to tie it up. But I'm sure these kids are going to come from all over Canada. So how are we bringing back in with their local community, their relationship there, what they were hoping to contribute locally. Right, so I think my criteria for their ideas that they're submitting is to benefit 
a, lo a community somewhere in the world. So it's their choice, it's a very broad term. It could be a local community, it could be across Canada, it could be a global, a global community. So I, I, I would hope that we would end up choosing, depending on the ideas that come in, a broad range of kids who would cover the gamut. And I also, I wouldn't discount the social media here, too. I mean, the kids are really, really active in that, and I think that there's a huge opportunity for this, and obviously off-network opportunities as well. Yeah, I'd like to say on the social media side, I think, that, I think this is great for, for, for getting brands involved with, with the kids, with the schools, with the communities, educational packages, and I think the inspirational side of it, I've seen quite a few of the brands that I look for are, are absolutely after that. But I would, I would echo Christine's a little bit in terms of if there is going to be one kid who's going to end up in tears crying. We just need to watch that because not many brands would want to sort of be, uh, well, there's be going two down things, There's two things I want to say about that. <laughs> One is that the final challenge when it's down to the last two, they would be able to bring back the kids to be on their team so they're not completely removed from the series. They still have an opportunity to contribute. And then the other thing is there could be, not told this at the beginning, but a great move for a brand would be, you know what, you didn't think you were going to win, but guess what, we're still funding your project or a portion of it. So then they get to look like the good guy and everyone's happy in the yeah, end. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> even if there's a loser, they should, always, they should all win in some shape or form. Yeah, so they the win brand, in the some way because this is kids yeah. and it is charity in the, right. at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah. good. That's a great pitch, and we get it. Right. Yeah. Look yeah. at that, yeah. and you're under your eight minutes. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Judy that was just Handelman. great. Yeah. Uh, can I just say? Oh. Can I just say? So, can I just say? Uh, Paul, you wanted to say. It, it looks like I'm really miserable and uh, and awful on my little dial here, but it's not working for for most of what I was doing. I was up near the 60s on that. So. Oh no, it's like golf. The lowest score is actually. I better. know. So if look, it says 70 over here, and it says 35 up there. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, Maybe it's the sort. conversion. Maybe hey. it's 35 pounds. <laughs> I just don't want. I just don't want to look like. I just don't want to look like a miserable old bloke sitting at the front. Right. So. Okay, understood. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody could accuse you of that. Thank you very as much. charming as you are, handsome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to know you. And okay, <laughs> uh, Tom, your feedback on Judy Handelman in the hot seat. She did great. She had a heck of a lot of poise. Uh, she knows uh, clearly what she wants to do. And also, I think more is importantly, I mean, she took your advice, your criticism, and, I, and she, she, she evolved with the show with it. So, you know, you, you love working with an executive like that. Rob, the old rule of Hollywood, and you don't say anything until you get back in the elevator after a meeting. What would you say to Judy after that eight-minute tap dance? I thought, she, uh, I thought she kept it tight, and uh, she answered the question. She didn't go beyond the question, which was good. She kept it on point. Uh, good job. Um, Duncan, quickly, your feedback on uh, any trends you noticed in the real-time uh, perception analyzer. Yeah, the, uh, the judges loved anything about CSR and brand. Talking about brand sponsorship, huge potential there. The, the scores always went up when, when she talked about that. I think she lost them in the details. I'm not sure if it was that they didn't like the details, or maybe she didn't maybe have the mastery of it. But the killer wasn't just the kid weeping on TV, but when I saw it, it was the cookies. The word cookie you know what, we're all thinking girl guides. And, and there's just something there, it just, that one phrase resonated badly. Scores dropped about 30 points. It like a girl guide crying with a cookie in her mouth? That's too, magic. It felt, it felt too small. To you people, that's a TV show. To me, that's just a Saturday. It's but great, um, I, I found that it felt so judges, too small. It, just, it didn't feel big enough. Okay, good to know. So take a moment now and uh, uh, convene, if you like, make some notes on Judy Handelman as we turn to finalist number two, Jordan and Andre, come on out, guys. Wait, wait, did we lock in our votes? No, not yet. No, 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 we're going to discuss our win. Who wins? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. I don't want to know, so I'm not even going to ask what you've been doing for the last 20 minutes. Instead, I will just shepherd you to the mic, welcome you here, remind you that you have eight minutes for this uh, casual meeting. Brian, maybe you'd start us off this time. Let's have the five-second countdown clock to our eight-minute meeting with Jordan and Andre. Start now. Sure, I'd love to just hear a little bit about how... All right, now. Yeah, so I'd, I'd love to just hear a little bit about what you think an episode would look like. Um, length, but also kind of uh, stages along the way. Cool. Go sure. Yeah. It's a 13-part, thir uh, one-hour series. Uh, five acts. Um, what happens is... Uh, in Act One, it's the children, or sorry, the organization introduces the audience to the child, to the affliction, does some background information, people learn about what's going on. Um, Act Two follows that with, uh, there's a, they've interviewed the child already, yeah, and they start prepping for the wish. Act Three is the implementation of the wish. And then the cliffhanger there is we actually take that wish to the next level, so that's all of Act Four. We do something really 
awesome with the child. And then Act 5 is the aftermath, where you know, we see how it affected everybody involved, and uh, it, it's a really good feeling show. I got to say that I didn't get your show. It's interesting because you liked it right away in the one minute and I was going, huh? Until you did the one sentence at, in the recap because I had missed that it was about the people that make these happen. So I'm actually not hearing that even then. Are we, is this like a docu-soap about a cast of characters in an office of that foundation that we're going to see the same people every episode that are doing it for a different kid every week? Yeah, it's... Um... <laughs> I guess the best way to think of it uh, is the Extreme Home Makeover edition. So this will be a host-driven show. And uh, we will follow, for the first season, the local Toronto, Canada chapter of Make-A-Wish Foundation. And as they go through the process of selecting uh, these children for the extreme wishes, because they go through about four or 500 wishes a year. So uh, they know best, and we would work with them to choose those children and why they should be. So have you met them already, the Make-A-Wish people? And, and they... They don't mind coming on TV uh, themselves. That's they're actually crazy. they're actually quite excited about the idea of showcasing the office. Okay. Like what's that. the general size of a Make a Wish office? Obviously, they're going to vary a bit. But what's the Toronto one? Uh, Toronto is about thirty to forty people. I'd say yeah. Minus, yeah, yeah. But I gotta say, just so you know, I mean, I think the idea of, of seeing what happens for these kids is obviously fantastic. What's new about this is I have no idea what those people actually do to get this done. So. I'm hoping that that really is the focus, as much as we want to have the focus be what's happening to the kids, but what's new it, is, this, 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 is these people. Exactly, and that's what we wanted to bring to light. It's, it's, there's so many people that work day in and day out for you know, 365 days a year to just bring this moment uh, to these children, to let them be children, and the, and the unsung heroes that go into it. And then it's not just the Make-A-Wish people, it's also the sponsors that come on board. I mean, there's some major sponsors that already work with Make-A-Wish, and so we want to talk to the WestJet people and you know the precious cargo that they're flying to Disneyland. We want to talk to the people behind the scenes at Disney. We want to talk to Honda, who's going to give them the van to get there. Like All these people that we... we know exist, but we don't know who they are, and just a little bit of appreciation. There's a brilliance of self-fulfilling prophecy here as well, you know, because in essence, you know, you use the power of television to, you, you can move mountains, so clearly, you know, whatever they're looking for, they're, you know, they'll actually get a chance to push it much farther than they ever would because of television. Mm -hmm. mm. What, so what is the percentage, I mean, in, kind of in general, like of the 30 or 40 people that are volunteers versus paid? That is actually something we have not asked them. Know, and are you going to see uh, some episodes where they're going to attempt to fulfill someone's wish, but it may not come to fruition? Tell me more about <laughs> the drama. Well, I know. So I want to understand that. Yeah, we don't want to exploit the children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is not the point of the show. And we actually approached the Make-A-Wish, and we went, this is about you. And should something happen with one of the child children in the program, it's not the focus for the child. It's how this affected the people that were working on that dream. But to John's so, point, what he's looking for is, will there be an element of drama in that journey? The, yeah. You know, like that they almost don't do it. Something happens, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. beyond just applauding. I think yeah. inherently given the, the extreme wish that we want to bring to it, we'll add the complication to what they do already. So I think trying, like for example, um, the, uh, the sports dream, you know, want to put our kid in a reenactment of a fourth and goal situation or a bases loaded, you know, two, two men out. What's involved in bringing two sports teams together, filling the stadium with people to make this kid feel like they're a superstar? There's, gonna, there's always going to be something going on. Okay. And if I can actually just um, add to that, John, the, the reason that we went to Make-A-Wish is the children that they help, they all have potentially life-threatening illnesses that they're dealing with. And we wanted to make sure that we were clear on that, that we're not exploiting these sick kids. A lot of times these kids end up being ambassadors for the illnesses that they've had to deal with and that they're going through. And that's part of what we're actually going to work into our transmedia content, is to continue those stories along. An hour seems really long to me mm. for that. And, um, I mean, a lot of what we do is in, in short form, and I feel like that story could be told. It just seems really long. To, it, it, you feel like that can really be stretched that, across that time? It's, it's something we've kicked around both as a 30 minute and 60, yeah, as a 60 minute format. And it just feels comfortable as an hour long format. But you know, you might also, if, if it worked better, you work with two or three kids. I mean, the whole idea yes. is that there are multiple wishes. Some might take the longer arc. So in essence, I think that might be something to explore as well. 
I mean, that's why I've been trying to probe here about the docu-soap sort of style, that it is two or three kids an episode. And again, it's you're going into the environment of, of that organization as opposed to just one kid per hour. Anyway, it's, it's something to think about. Right, there could be stories that carry over. Yeah. 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 We would love to have Tom produce that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, is there brand questions about this? Is there uh, opportunities for brand association? Well, yeah, I mean, most definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, Medicom, my CEO, runs a kind of a similar kind of charity thing, and we, you know, he leverages all kinds of brands through Medicom to try and do this kind of stuff. And I think that the brands that you mentioned that probably are involved with Make a Wish would like to talk to you and talk through Make a Wish to you about amplifying what they already do. I think you don't need, you shouldn't go too overboard in terms of whatever branding you do within it, because I think the story is about the children, but, but that's the conversation ha you'd have with the brands. Have you also thought about, because you know, internationally, Make-A-Wish isn't necessarily, you know, in different countries, the UK, France are going to have different charities. Have you thought about giving it a name so that it can also be formatted? We actually found out that uh, in our research, Make-A-Wish is in 48 countries. But so, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that it's got the kind of presence that right, it does. Though. Absolutely right. And I so, think, like, Daring to Dream right now is, is what we're going with. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think it sounds great, guys. Yeah, I do, Jim. Well, Very can good. I just add something? So we've got 50 seconds. Uh, we just found out, actually, that we have right. uh, a good candidate for a host um, on board. Yeah, we, we've been working through MMG Talent to try to secure a host. And so far, Kevin Jonas has uh, shown interest in the program. That's good. We'd that's also nice like to know what, uh, yeah, who you might think would work no, here. I, I, that's a great idea, and I, I heard that. Uh, in addition to that, in the sports and uh, music areas of our company, you know, there's so many people that I think are part of this organization, and we'll tie those celebrities in depending on the wish from each of those buckets. So a lot of star power. Okay, thank great you. job, guys. Sounds like no great. more questions. Let's hear it for Jordan and Andre. Thank you. Well done, guys. We'll see what happens. Rob, is working with an established brand like Make-A-Wish Foundation easier in that it's a potentially familiar brand, or does that actually make it a little harder to navigate those choppy waters? I, I, I think that having them involved so that we could also be able to look back at some of the wishes they've fulfilled and sort of show the examples from A to Z of what they've accomplished is a good thing. So I think the brand's helpful. Okay, Tom, your feedback for Jordan and Andre. Well, I, I thought they did a good job. I mean, I think the biggest hurdle you have is, is clearly, you know, the, the identification with really, really ill children, you know, and in essence, in, in cases terminal. But I, I, I know that organization doesn't just do that. They're working with, with ch children that are ill, you know, that, that can recover. So in essence, I think that's really important that we push that kind of, the, that, that element as well. So I, they did a great job. It's good great. stuff. Thanks for your feedback, gentlemen. And now to Duncan, any trends noticeable, um, good or bad, hills and valleys? I got, I got three things. Uh, people <coughs> often make fun of the entertainment industry for being heartless. It's not true. When they said we will not exploit children, uh, the judges liked that, which was surprised me. Surprised me. <laughs> I was expecting, you know, a different reaction. Um, real steady build. Started out in the 20s and 30s, just kept going higher. and Feels almost like the show might run. It might take time to build an audience, but as people kind of fall in love with the concept, it'll keep growing. Final one. You pitch people, not an audience. The audience never moved between 48 and 52, whereas individual judges had time to fall in love with the idea. Interesting. Very concise and uh, clever and astute feedback. Thank you very much, Duncan. Let's hear it one more time for Jordan and Andre. They did great. I want to have him in my life. Which brings us to our current front runner. You remember him as Daniel. Daniel, come on out here. Was he the front runner? That's right, he was. Welcome back, Daniel. Uh, just let's get her going. What do you say? Five seconds on the countdown clock. You'll let's have eight minutes to talk to the judges. John, you want to start this one off? Here comes the countdown clock now. Daniel, um, you did a great job with the, the short pitch, sure. but the devil's in the detail with this show. And uh, I really want to hear about the structure of the show and take me through the beats sure. of, of an episode and how it's going to work. Well, in Act 1, basically, we're going to meet the family. Um, we'll meet, I mean, other than the tease content, all that stuff, the basic structure of the act would be meet the family, pose the social question, brainstorm, figure out how could we mess with people, what could we do. We get to see the inner dynamics between the family themselves, which is another payoff for the show. Uh, and then throughout uh, sort of the end of that, they're going to have to test a key element that without it, this hoax can't work. And so we take that into the act two. In act two, we figure out how that worked, what was the best way, maybe they brainstorm three ways for one particular episode, and which one worked, which one didn't. In act two, they'll basically start to build it. 
So that's kind of where the Mythbusters kind of angle comes in. They rehearse characters, they audition people, they get magicians, they reconstruct a bathroom, whatever they need to do. Um, at that point, they also take on their characters, they start rehearsing to each other. We also get a little bit of the family dynamic. They kind of prank each other sometimes, they mess around. Um, and all of this is kind of scripted and controlled. And to act three, they finally go into sort of the, the final moments before the big either real estate open house or whatever that is. And then we manage to be able to pull that into act four for the final big payoffs because we just keep accelerating it and building and building and building rather than one prank. Uh, and then ultimately there's the big payoff and the conclusion. I don't get it. Are they a real family? Um, these, these they are not a real family. They um, are? They are not a real family. Oh, they are a cast? cast troop of actors. Okay. Um, but what I think you could do with it is you could really mess with the public in sort of a social media aspect as to whether or not they're a real family. And then when you actually find yourself on that point where maybe people are getting it through social networking, then you use it to your advantage. See, Daniel and I have been arguing about this because I actually think <laughs> that it should be a real family. Because in essence, if you, you, you know a, a personal dynamic uh, w within a group and you know something's going to go off, something's going to set somebody off, and you go on from week to week, I, I still believe that it's, it's stronger with a real family cast. How, it's possible. Uh, how large is a family? Oh, it's a nuclear family. For, it's like the Reagan family. Okay, but are there like an aunt or an uncle or grandmother? Yeah, well, those or different people come people? in and out of their lives. Like we'll have, you know, so the, the nuclear structure of it is the dad, the mom, sort of, you know, uh, standard family, and then tween uh, kid, so let's say maybe 10 or 11. They'll obviously be a little bit older, play younger. And then the t we're thinking like a teen daughter, 14, 15, 16. Um, pets, anything from crazy pets to trained pets. Um, and then there'll be the nuclear family of like, you know, the, the excess, uh, sort of the, the outside family, like the crazy aunt, the uncles, the grandma. Um, and they can come in and out of the show. Um, I still don't get it. Do they win something? No. This they is what just, they do. They, they just love this do stuff. It because this they... is like prank 2.0. They love this. So, okay. They're basically almost producing their show. So it's like a comedy. It. Yeah, it's it's 80 percent scripted, Family 20 percent not. Yeah. Yeah. If, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, you know, just from my my because I'm working in media, but if you'd have thought of a brand that might want to play with this kind of yeah. thing, it's it's kind of a difficult subject for brands to get their heads around. Totally. They're into a very irreverent kind of. Have you thought about? Yeah. So what kind of things do you think like? Well, you obviously have to go after a brand that's got a sense of humor yeah. and fun and adventure. I, I, I don't think we'll be going after like diapers. Um, yeah. Maybe, I don't know. Um, we, you know, to be honest, I'd really like to hear what, uh, what Rob thinks about that. It's yeah. just, you know, there's a, there's, a brand, there's a brand that, you know, I'm from the UK and Fosters do this kind of, they sponsor comedy and they very reverent kind of yeah. almost games in their advertising. But totally. when you're doing a family, if you've got kids in there and the jokes on one of the younger members of the family, perhaps a beer brand might not want to. Well, the thing Why? is, the families are very, the, the kids are very active, right? This is, this yeah. is a, for, in many ways, this is almost could be a kid's show for the right broadcast, right? Because at the end of the day, the kids are actually, some of them, they're designing the pranks sometimes, they're brainstorming with the family, they take charge in some episodes. And, and the fun part also is the fact that not, you, you won't know all the gags right away. There'll be surprises in there. And I think that the, kind of the adults may just, you know, oh, we got a couple of, of pranks that we, we've been thinking about for the, for the kids that are part of our family. So in essence, you, it, the joke's not always told. So in essence, you're not just practicing that. And also, I think that you're going to do multiple opportunities here. It won't be one pizza delivery guy. There'll be five pizza delivery guys. And you're going to take the best of that. So you can have some montage, and you can have the big setup, and then ultimately, the one that's the funniest is the one that, that, that's, your, that's your fourth act. Yeah. So one, one sort of hoax per episode, is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, uh, totally open to making it into slightly more, you know, maybe segmented if that works better. And also, for, for example, for the web, we'd love to do something that was either a shorter format because of the simple act structure, like you can really compress it down to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, what I like about the whole thing is it evolves. It's a family that's doing this. There's a family dynamic. It's the perfect kind of hybrid between reality and scripted comedy. And what I love about it is you can take it to the next level. Like, how far can you go with the drunken mom at the soccer game. Like, how far can you go with, like, the pizza delivery boy that's got to hold a, a prop baby that's peeing and crying and screaming or, you know, reinsert a kid's secret belly button ring before mom comes home. So there's, there's so many things you could do with it, and I think it does fit in the half hour, 22. Right. And they like doing it, though. They love it. This is them. I, 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 I mean, I completely agree with Tom. If we can find I was just gonna the say, real family, it is the real deal, right? This like, is if you like can find finding the, the, the real Kardashians Penn and Teller. of yeah. whatever. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically I, I Prank's that. first family. Well, yeah. I, but I, cause I, I think you've got to fall in love with these people because yeah. this is who's going to keep you coming. I mean, there's a very successful you, format in the U.S. Uh, on Spike TV that, that's that. It's just a group of guys who have been together forever yeah. and they pull sure. pranks. It's the same thing. You're just going to find a family that's a little wacky and they just that's their lives. They basically love, yeah. you know, upsetting the apple cart. You know, like the world has their acrobats and the world has their family of like magicians and this is the world of pranksters. Yeah. And I yeah. think that, I mean, that to me, that's the biggest challenge, though, because we, we've tried a couple of uh, prank-type shows, and they're mm. really dependent. And Impractical Jokers is what you're talking about, which is really good. Yeah. But it's all the guys. They're great, and their chemistry yeah. is great. So 
That's a chat. You, you probably don't have people in mind yet. Um, actually, we've been looking for people. Um, but to be honest, we're open to both times, right? So we still feel like we can do it with a real family. You know, we can do nationwide, you know, casting. You know, we can go U.S. and Canadian for that market. And at the same time, there's no problem, I think, casting this as a real family if they're not a real family. I mean, I, I, I do like the idea of the real family. Is yeah, no, you've got to rule these guys. I think the nationwide casting thing is yeah. something that would be brilliant through social media and everything. Yeah, else. Oh, so you yeah. could really build on that. Yeah. And again, Send brand, us your best prank. And, brands and also, would love to. Uh, don't don't them. discount this idea that that the, that that MythBuster element. You know, how do you actually create stunts? Because mm -hmm. in essence, that to me is a guy. I really want to know how you do that. How do you make someone actually believe that there's a tiger walking outside yeah. your house? How do they actually do that? So in essence, watching the rigging, watching all the, the that setup. stuff, really yeah. the setups. Yeah really yeah. work for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of the half, like the, one of the reasons that I, I like the 22 minute format for it, for TV, is that in most, like the Just for Laughs or Candid Camera, all those shows, the, the, the early prank shows, what works for them is that you're, you're seeing one quick setup for 20 seconds and it's a repeat of a billion people doing it. What I like is the evolving family, the dynamic. You can almost do story arcs over seasons without having to commit to them. Well, you know what's going to sell it in the room, you know this, and most producers know that, is a sizzle reel because you've found yep. them. I yeah, mean, it's, it's all... It's a real good is, prank. <laughs> well, you've got to find them. Mm -hmm. yep. And then yeah. put it in, in the machine, and, go, and we'll go, wow, there they are. Totally. So, yeah, you got it. Okay, good. Casting, all the yeah. Okay, sounds like no more questions. Yep, thanks. Um, let's Thank hear you. it for Daniel, everybody. Nice job, Daniel. I don't get it. Are, are the kids crying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> depends what age group we're going You don't understand. That's what's these. going right now. That's what people are buying. You're breaking like, a theme yeah. if they're not. They want children yeah. weeping we and cookies and sadness. Oh, they can cry on command. That's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And like you can FedEx them but around. It's better to watch them make adults cry. That's right. what the show would excel at. Rob, truthfully, when you hear a pitch like this, it doesn't necessarily have marquee names attached to it. Do you tune out? It depends on who you've got as a sizzle. I mean, I think one of the thoughts I was sharing here with our producer is that maybe you use online to find the family. Maybe you let people prank and you, you choose from that in some form. Mm -hmm. I do think you need the personalities. Yeah, yeah. So Tom, do you feel strongly enough that it should be a real family, that if a buyer was willing to buy it with a casted family, you would say, forget it? Well, no, it's not that. It, look, it, it just mixes the format a little bit much. I mean, I just love the idea that these guys have been doing it. I mean, I know families like this. And like, like you said, that, that show on True, I mean, those guys, they, they've been doing it for years. So why not take advantage of that type of dynamic? You know, the challenge you have is that so much of it is fabricated that you, it might get a little too cloudy with a fabricated family and a fabricated prank and a fabricated... Mm -hmm. I need some reality to ground myself. Exactly. So I, I'd, I'd be stuck there, right? Yeah. So... That's Could be it. a different family every week, by the way. This week, the, the Pranksteins will be put through <laughs> the paces. Um, Duncan, real-time insight and analysis. Yeah. Any trends that you spotted? Yeah, for sure. Um, the description of it as different acts, where you focused on the idea of the setup, people hated that the first time through. But the second time through, when we talked about it as Mythbusters and the mechanics of pranking, that went, that went strong. That was in the 70s. Um, weirdly, although you were number one score from the meters of the audience, First time around, you actually, this was very weak. Uh, what are you doing? I was pranking you. I was seeing if you'd notice. That worked really well. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the other one uh, just uh, scored well is once you talk about it as a real family, that overall just sent the needle way up. Uh, my, well, my partner. Interesting. <laughs> Daniel, yeah. take a, a stand back here if you wouldn't mind. Great job, Daniel. Let's bring our other two finalists out. Did you have another thought, Rob, that you wanted to add? Well, it actually goes for all of them, which is just, you know, I was listening closely as this was happening, and one of the things I really took to heart was John Moranis' willingness to spend money against all of this. It's so true. So sizzle reels, you know, I think there's really a, you know, an opportunity to shine every single one of these up on him. But John I'll Moranis, help. his name is like a credit card in Banff. I've been dropping I, that thing I, all I over will, town. I will absolutely help How will you that. be paying for this, sir? Uh, John Moranis. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, your three finalists, you've seen their eight-minute sessions. They all did really well. A round of applause for them, quick like a bunny. Let's give the judges a moment to confer now and decide who the winner of this Dealmakers Live version 2 is. Meanwhile, I would like to say that the format for Dealmakers Live was created and produced by Alan Novak and All Screen Entertainment. So a round of applause for Alan. It's a pretty neat deal that we've been doing. Might as well take this opportunity to give a big thanks to Duncan Stewart for being here from Deloitte, Canada. To Tom Beers and to Rob Keneally, thank you for your insight. It is Learntertainment, and we have managed to learn a lot through this simulated experience. Gentlemen and lady, why don't you come down front and center?
as we are a tingle with anticipatory delight awaiting the winner. I'll use this opportunity to do one last bit of housekeeping. If you could leave your handheld units on your seats when you leave after this exciting announcement, that would be great. Have we reached a resolution? You need another minute? Cue the suspense track, part two. So judges, you have reached a verdict. Rebecca, no. kill no, the suspense just, track, okay. please. Okay, judges, doing you it. have reached a verdict, and this is it I hold in my hand. I have the words in my mouth, and I'm about to say them out loud. But let me remind you what you're playing for. A meeting with, with the judge of your choice to further discuss your idea, an IPID 3, VIP tickets to the Rockies Gala, Tickets were being scalped for upwards of 800 yen earlier today. And the prestigious title of Banff 2012 Dealmaker Live. The winner is, ladies and gentlemen, by unanimous vote, Judy Handelman. Judy, congratulations. You are our Dealmaker Live 2012. Keep it going for Daniel, Andre, and Jordan. Look at that thing. Judy Handelman, congratulations. Please, no photos. <laughs> have you given any thought to which judge you'd like to have a further meeting with? I have given some thought. Do I have to answer right now? You don't have to, but it would be a great ending to the show. Oh, I think I'd like to chat with Paul. Love shopping with Paul Chard. <laughs> congratulations, Judy Handelman. Thanks for coming to Dealmakers Live 2012. We'll see you next year at Dealmakers Live 3. Have a great night, everybody.